All right, let's uh, join Connie and her guests and uh, get a little insight as to what all of this means, especially that 145 uh, seat leading an elected uh, position that they sit in right now. Connie? All right, Dan. Well, looking at the whole trend toward voting nationally when it comes to the leader rather than your local rep, yet Hamilton is staying the same, bucking this trend if, in fact, it does prove to be a trend. Hamilton's staying exactly the same. What does this mean when they're at the table um, in Ottawa? Does Hamilton lose out? I think what it's saying is that Hamilton believes in national leadership. We have conservative colors in Hamilton and we have NDP colors in Hamilton, which means the opposite is also true, that no one believed in Stefan Dion's leadership in Hamilton. I think to, in many cases we are looking at the leader of the party as opposed to our local reps, and I think there's great challenges now for the leadership party of the Liberals. I'll be shocked if Stefan Dion is still leading the Liberal Party in the near future. We're looking at a leadership convention? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, it's going to be a lot of pressure very soon uh, to make a change and figure out what they're going to do to turn this around. They're, they're coming off a minority government and then two straight losses and this is just not the guy who's going to deliver it for them. And uh, Nick was saying before, the Liberals are Canada's party. They have been dominant in politics since time began and it's just not the case. They need to find somebody new, and I think there'll be a lot of pressure to get somebody in there soon. You have to wonder what would happen if someone else won that leadership convention. And you've been sort of switching heads with, with some of the leaders, uh, Nick, in terms of what if Jack Layton was leading the Liberal yeah, Party, yeah. in fact, or cashed in on that opportunity. Well, I'll tell you, I'm very, very impressed with Leighton. I think that he shone, actually, throughout this campaign. He talked to the average Canadian. He was very succinct. He was very eloquent. As I've said before, he was very Obama-esque in the way he delivered like that his word, message. Yes, you do. <laughs> and we have to wonder, I mean, if Leighton was not part of the NDP, if Leighton was part of the Liberals, or if Leighton was part of the Conservatives, would we in fact have Leighton as a potential prime minister? Because candidate? he won so yeah. many of the popularity polls, yeah. and you say he missed an opportunity. I think there was a huge opportunity when he started out in this election and realized his popularity. If he had just shifted the party a little bit towards the middle, they wouldn't have to uh, completely give up on their belief systems, but just show that shift that yes, we are ready to govern. We're ready to not just be social responsibility, but leaders in the community. I think he would have stole a huge chunk of votes from the Liberals, and they could be the opposition right now, which would be a massive improvement for them. But by sticking to their guns and really sticking to the NDP hardline views, they missed out on what could have been a, a great change for Canada, because then you would have had a Conservative government with a very left of center opposition, and, and that could create great fights, right? That's going to, and it's going to have a positive result for the people, because that social responsibility would have been there with that technical governance uh, running the show. Will Harper listen to the Dave Christoffersons, the Wayne Marsdens? Will he listen to these these political veterans, especially David Christofferson, who has sat in cabinet under the Bob Ray government? Harper doesn't listen to his own people. He's not <laughs> going to listen to anybody from the NDP. He's got a series of advisors who he goes to, but it's he's a, got a minority government. It's, it's a pretty small. No, he's got a rock solid mandate. What are we at? 40, 145 now. Yeah, Nick's winning so far. No, Harper. yeah, Nick's got the bet. I owe you twenty bucks. <laughs> And uh, there's just no fear of an election. He is going to govern like a majority prime minister. There's no question. He's going to wake up tomorrow morning and act like he has a majority. And he's going to say, this has given him a mandate. He's gone from 127 to 145. It's game on. So this hasn't changed him. This hasn't changed the Harper image, the Harper approach. I don't think so. I think what's going to be changed more so is what's going to happen in the Liberal Party and how they're going to try to reinvent themselves. We'll see what happens. All right, back to you, Nick. He was emotional, and he was the subject of some dirty tricks, wasn't he? Well, when it comes to ethical behavior, there was a little bit of nastiness going on. I mean, in the business school, we teach the three foundation pillars, leadership, innovation, and ethics. The issue with ethics is you have this reputation that's clean once. As soon as you cross the line, 
it's impossible to ever get back that standing of ethical behavior. So I thought that things were a little bit nasty. I've seen way nastier, but I wouldn't say that they were outlandish this time around. No, and what I've done throughout my professional career, what we always taught in the sales organizations was you never slam your competition. You talk about the good qualities you have. You can ask questions that might lead to a lacking element of your competition, but you never come out and say anything negative. Politicians have forgotten this. I don't know when it became popular to go out and start slamming as opposed to talking about all the good you're going to do. Hopefully it'll shift back at some point. Well, why does it hurt some and not others, though? Because obviously Chris Child was very gracious in, in alluding to the fact that the Liberals had, had slammed her campaign with the telephone hours. But did the dirty tricks hurt the Harper Conservatives? No, and I think it's an issue of severity and who's doing the hurting. Obviously, when you have the Prime Minister... Well, the Puffin, yeah. Pope, and Stefan Dion, allusions to his, his disconnect with yeah. the English language. And there's also the issue of what happened with the broadcaster, with uh, Stefan's interview. And that's that a big taken. ethical issue yeah. that really uh, speaks to the yeah. broadcasting industry uh, as so, well. So I think in that particular case, the broadcaster's at question. It wasn't one party's fault or another. And I think in many cases, people actually felt sorry for Stefan Dion in that case because clearly he didn't want that portion of the interview to be live on television. So sometimes they backfire, even though in the case it was the broadcaster, and it actually could work in their favor. Clearly it didn't work for Stefan Dion's favor either way. So I think what we learn about backstabbing is what we see from other elections as well. Obviously we're very close to the U.S., so we watch what's happening down there. But I don't see much nastiness happening in the U.S. either as well when you compare it to other Mediterranean culture elections or even elections in South America where things do get very, very personal. Yeah, I think it's more a question of did anybody cross a line that wasn't expected? And, and I'm not saying that that's appropriate, but we've come up with a standard of political ethics that we view as acceptable, and nobody crossed that line this election. It may still have crossed a lot of lines for individuals, but as a country, what we view to be okay, most people on the Puffin thing really didn't have a big problem with it. They just considered it politics. Is that the right thing to say? Probably not. But it's not crossing the line. Now what we did see that we've never seen in Canada is people being threatened. And the issue of people having break cables vandalism. cut. And vandalism. Yeah. And people being afraid to put signs up. So I hope that's not a view of what's to come. Where you're not willing to put a sign on your front lawn because you're afraid somebody will disagree with who you're supporting and, that would and take action. And that would in turn, even disengage more and more right. voters and potential voters. It's going to lead to greater apathy. Yeah. And, and next time we'll be talking about 21% of the voters making up their mind of who leads this country. A final word from you about the um, polls that at one point not that long ago showed the Liberals actually leading in Ontario. What happened? I think this science of polls is just broken. Uh, it leads to decisions that are being made by individuals who are undecided that perhaps shouldn't have been made. I also noticed in the polls just in the last five or six days that that gap had closed significantly between the Conservatives and the Liberals. Clearly we see from the evidence tonight that Conservatives were rising and the Liberals were falling. So to the extent that polls make a difference to the undecided, I'm not in support of. The issue is, of course, you have to educate the populace and that's what polls are really for to educate people in terms of the issues to educate them in terms of the quality of the candidates so in that respect I don't think we're ever going to get rid of polls but I think people who are undecided in future elections should take polls with a grain of salt and the ultimate poll is on election day because no one knows how that individual is going to vote in behind that election booth